Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Frances Steed Sellers, a senior writer at the Washington Post. It gives me great pleasure this afternoon to welcome two guests, Ursula Burns, the former CEO of Xerox, and Erica James, who's the Dean of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. A very warm welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank I'm you. glad to be here. We're very glad to have you both. Ursula, I'd like to start with you and talk about some of the very bold stands that companies have taken over issues, social issues like Black Lives Matter, climate change. Is it incumbent upon business leaders to make stances like this now? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. It has always been. I just don't think that there was a feeling of comfort um, or support for business leaders to engage in what I call the social dynamics of the world that they live in. Uh, and right now, I think it's becoming, it has become unavoidable. Uh, sitting in silence actually sounds ridiculous and is ridiculous. Employees, uh, shareholders, communities are asking for input, support. Um, they want to be engaged. They want a better outcome. And it's difficult if you are a large employer to be silent um, when every constituent that you that you are engaged with, or at least most of them, um, are requiring or asking for your point of view, your help, et cetera. So I think it's really important that, and it's becoming natural, more natural now that businesses are starting to speak up. Are there ever dangers of becoming too political in this very divided climate, climate alienating either consumers or shareholders? But speaking up is not necessarily becoming political. This is a, This is part of the interesting conversation, right? When we speak about justice um, and diversity and inclusion, these are not political, at the root, political issues. They are social issues that we have politicized. So I think it's important that we kind of move away from the the demonization of an issue by, and by calling it a political issue. Obviously, it gets down to politics, but we have to start way back at the cause and the reason why we're having the discussion in the first place. When you have a business that makes a significant amount or all of its profit from consumers and you actually don't treat those consumers equally, fairly, you don't include them in the decision making, if you have employees who are not included, if you have gender or race issues, those become political issues only after businesses actually don't do what they should do as humans, right? This is not as a political stance. Yeah, a very good point there. And uh, Erica, maybe you can follow up on this from the point of view of the business school leader. Um, what do you bring to this in terms of the education and what are students bringing in as well in terms of demands of, of leadership as they go through the business school? Yeah, Francis, that's such an important question. And business schools really are a conduit in this supply chain, if you will, of talent into corporate America or any, any business and, and the various sectors. Uh, one of the observations I've had in recent years is the students who are coming into business schools are fundamentally different students than what we've seen in, in previous generations. They are coming with the expectation that in the course of their studies, they will have access to faculty and scholarship and experiences and internships for which they are engaging in these important social matters. And I just will echo what Ursula said that um, it, it, this is really a human issue. It is not a political issue. And our students are driving this topic. They're forcing faculty to engage with them in this topic. They're, they are leading the conversations in ways that, in some cases, faculty are, are um, catching up to. But in other ways, there's also a new generation of faculty that are equally as um, socially minded as the students are. And so there's this convergence now in business schools where you're seeing a new crop of faculty, an incoming generation of students, and they're meeting in an aligned way, driving uh, the curricula around matters of justice and equity. I was going to ask you exactly about that. Has the curriculum changed? Has what, what is being taught changed? The, the desire for the curriculum to change is definitely uh, part of the vernacular. It's part of the ethos in business education right now. But it's a slow process. You're asking people who have 
uh, become very accustomed to uh, delivering their content in certain ways and using certain case studies and, and having certain examples. And we're asking them to change how they think about what they deliver and how they deliver. So that's a slow process. There's not as there's not resistance to doing so. It's just it will take a while to get the plethora of case studies through the pipeline or the plethora of examples to be able to use. One way that we're combating that though is by bringing executives into the classroom uh, to to talk firsthand about challenges that they're facing right now. And the students are really enjoying those experiences. And one of the silver linings of, of this pandemic, and there are very few, but one is um, the access with which we can bring people into the classroom to engage with our students on these topics. Ursula, as a leader, a business leader, um, can you talk about the issue of performative allyship, the notion of people saying the right things, but maybe not following through with actions? I mean, I think that we've we've grown up. Um, you've grown up. <laughs> My mother grew up. Um, her mother grew up with um, that reality that people, um, when particularly when it gets a little bit warm in the kitchen, will mouth um, the right stance, the right vocabulary, but it's not necessarily. It almost always is not followed up with action, particularly when it comes to race and gender issues. We've been fighting this quote unquote issue on race for 150, 200 years. And we have had many, many, many a start. Um, most of them a full start um, to try to close this gap. Same thing with gender. I think that the, what's happened now is that just as much, just as positive as um, technology has been, or just as negative as it has been, has also been positive. In that it's kind of hard to hide uh, behind the words anymore. It's hard, to, it's very, very difficult um, to continue to do things kind of under the cloak of darkness um, and not be called for it, not be called you know, to the mat for it. And what people are expecting, Erica said it, what, what new faculty is expecting, what students are expecting, what the parents of students are expecting, is that, that we educate and develop the whole person, one that can actually fit um, in a, a creative way in society. And in order, and it definitely starts well before um, college, but it's definitely reinforced in college. And for a long, and universities, and for a long time, the reinforcement was, was literally wealth over workers. It was capital over workers, it was all about the money, how quickly you could get it, um, and that was the measure. And what's happened lately, thank goodness, is that the world is opening up, particularly um, people who are going to be the leaders of the future, to understand that this probably is not the best way to run the railroad, right? When you can have 1% of the population literally not just own, but command um, wealth, power, access, um, and the rest of the world, the other six plus sigma of the world literally is excluded from those conversations. It just takes a little while for that um, uneasiness to start to show up in bad action, right? In, in an uncivil society. So I think that the good news right now is that it's not only educators, it's not only students, it's not only the people in the street, it's not even only business people. We are getting a little bit of government help here, just a little bit, because for a long time it wasn't there, where we start to realize that, you know, we can keep doing this the way that we've been doing it, but it doesn't, see, there's not a way that anybody can see a good outcome here. There's not a way that you can continue messing around the way that we've been messing out and thinking, okay, we'll be fine. We'll be fine in 100 years if these five guys have all the money and these 5,000 have none. These five guys have all the access in these 5,000. It just doesn't work for very long. Yeah, and I think that the good news is, is face, we're, we're literally facing it head on today. You are both such pioneers and, and Ursula, that's a, a fantastic description of this, this long historic problem. Erica, look forward for me if you can. Do you see the young people you are now got, seeing going through business school having the possibility of changing this longstanding dynamic, actually upending the, the sort of racial economic disparities we have in this country? 
I do, that the systemic issues are deep and deeply entrenched. Uh, nevertheless, I think there's we've reached a critical mass of young people who are not willing to tolerate a lack of accountability when it comes to these issues. So I think they're pushing, they're driving, they are much more savvy with how to use communication media and, and technologies in ways that will drive change uh, at a pace that I think we've not seen in the past. Um, and it's been, it's been a pleasant realization that what we're seeing is not only coming from a certain segment of the population, but people of all backgrounds are taking part in this movement, if you will. And I think that is what's contributing to a critical, a, a critical mass of, of energy and momentum that will facilitate change. Now, the, whether it will be weeks, months, years, decades, I don't know, but um, I think there's no going back from this moment. I would agree uh, with that. There is so little going back. There, it's very difficult to go back. The fundamental question is, you know, which forward are we going to accept, right? There's a bad forward and there's a good forward, but I think that the status quo for sure is over. Astor, I would love to follow up on that about the role of consumers who seem, according to studies, to value uh, purchasing from uh, purposeful companies, want, what, what, companies with a purposeful mission. Can you address that as somebody who obviously has to watch consumer trends and uh, the importance of the consumer in driving change? Yeah, and I think it's, it is clear that if you listen to the verbiage of consumers, I'm not talking about the actions yet, but the verbiage of cons consumers, they are more and more aware of the companies that they are doing business with. They are more and more aware of the fact that um, this company is a polluter or this company has bad or, or unacceptable work practices, et cetera. And so that awareness is good. That's the first you know, the, the first part of the solution, the first step in the solution. The question is, is, and I still haven't seen this quite yet, whether or not we have a sea change when the economic, when the true economics consistently present that that better company, that better company may cost more to deliver its goods and services than this not so better company. Um, and I, I think that, Erica said this, that we, I think we can't take our foot off the pedal here. We can't lower our expectations. Um, most, of the, most people are reasonably smart and sensible. And I don't mean, I'm not, not politically aligned at all, but they don't want to crush other people to get ahead. And if we continue to present the facts, the full story of the facts, to get that cheaper garment, to get that cheaper whatever, to get access to this, it, you're destroying whatever you're destroying, I think that, um, that consumers will be more likely, if we are consistent, to actually make the choice for the whole good versus for their immediate selves. Even though over the last four years, I have been shocked at how um, I have been um, proven wrong in that theory, <laughs> that people will go for the better, you know, the I'll, I'll take a little bit more pain if we can get access to a lot more things for a lot more people. But I'm hoping that that's, this isn't, I'm hoping, hope is not a strategy, but I'm hoping this isn't an anomaly or an aberration because we have not presented ourselves well, particularly in America, um, over the last four years. I'd like to ask you both about employee well-being and starting with you, Erica, is there a business argument for having employee well-being programs in terms <laughs> of employer retention and things? So there's definitely a business argument for having employee well-being, right? Because it is the employee base that allows for organizations to have the to deliver on its mission. And if we don't nurture and care for the employees, then the ability to deliver that mission, to deliver the product or the service, uh, is is weakened. So whether it's a specific program or not. Um, some programs might work better than others. Some might be more costly than others. But I think fundamentally, and this goes back to something Ursula said earlier, we have to think about this as a human issue. And when we engage and lead and manage and motivate and support and nurture uh, our employees as human beings, whether that is in an interpersonal relationship or whether that's some large scale organizational policy, 
um, I, each company has to figure that out for themselves, but I don't think there's an option not to care about the employee's well-being at this day and age. Ashina, of course, the, the pandemic has brought this all into a, uh, highlighted all these issues about well-being for employees. How has it affected the way corporate leaders think about their employees and their well-being? Yeah, I, I mentioned this earlier. Um, for a long time, our system valued capital over workers. It valued machinery over work. And I think what's happening now is that we are more and more aware that there is a top stop, an upper limit where you can abuse and abuse employees. There's an upper limit when they become not your ally, um, but they become your enemy. And I don't even mean an active enemy. They become a disgruntled, non-contributory member of the of the family. And I, you know, I, I answer this question a lot, and people ask me for business cases, and and this is not a business case issue. <laughs> it's just it's just wrong. And we had there was a time when we worried about these kinds of things just being wrong. Um, so it's just not right. I mean, these people contribute. The, these employees. <laughs> They are the company. If there was a way, trust me, to get a right to, to do your business without employing any of them, most people would have done that already. You need them. We need them. They are the value creators for just about every single enterprise. And it's 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 no longer can you give me a wellness program? Can you show me the return on it, the ROI of that? It's like if we can make the employees more sticky, more interested, more passionate, more creative. There is nothing at all wrong with any of those words. Even if it took us another 10 minutes out of their, in their lunch break, there's nothing wrong with that. We, and so I think thinking about it from a business case perspective actually minimizes the pervasiveness of the impact of employees on business. A couple of questions for you both about diversity. Erica, we, uh, we know that diversity is important in the workplace, that it's good for the bottom line. Why are so many companies still run by white men? <laughs> well, that's the question of the, of the century. Uh, it, it, honestly, there, that's the case because we've allowed it to be the case, because we've not uh, made people accountable for thinking more expansively when they consider talent and what they're looking for and where they go to seek that talent. And uh, it, it is clearly not, I've said this in other engagements, it, we've not prioritized looking for diverse talent and supporting and nurturing diverse talent. So until that happens, we'll continue to see the same kind of results that we've been seeing. Um, the other thing I would say is there is a level of fear still associated with diversity, both in terms of not knowing necessarily what to do, how to create more uh, equitable and fair and diverse environments, but also just talking about it in general. And until we get to the point where we're able to communicate effectively and productively around sensitive matters like diversity, if one thinks of that as sensitive, then uh, we're not going to achieve the kind of results that are possible. And we're going to continue to see segments of, of the, the communities not getting opportunity, and we're going to continue to not see talent being leveraged as maximally as it can be. Uh, Sudar, I think we have time for just one last question, and I, I'd like to ask it of you, and that is about Ros Brewer. You two are such trailblazers, and now we have another black woman coming along. She'll, become, she'll take the helm of Walgreens, but only the third black woman to lead a Fortune 500 company. Why has it taken so long, and how significant is this? It's massive, and I'm going to do a massive shout out to Roz. She's um, a friend, and I am unbelievably, unbelievably proud and so happy to no longer be the only, oh, the only, you know, it's kind of like people said that was a good thing. I'm like, really? I mean, how would you like to be the only anything? But the reason why, you know, think about, think about the world. Um, Erica said this, but we are we have we have a world structured and built on the backs of people black people women this is how this nation was built it was there's a supreme structure a supremacy structure in this country still that has white men at the very top of that structure and so you have white men then maybe you can have a push between white women and 
black men, you have Latinx floating in there. And at the very end of this conversation, if people think about it, maybe in a break, you say, oh my God, we have these black women as well. We are a small percentage of the population. We are stereotyped um, by every group, like every other group is stereotyped as well. And the supreme structures in this country, the structures of supremacy in this, in this company, in this country, political structures, educational structures, business structures, have been in existence from the time that this country was started. So to actually think that it's going to kind of change very quickly, it's, I think it's, a, it's silly thinking. It's gonna take, as Erica said, work. We're gonna to have to absolutely nurture every at every level. We're going to need the, the white men who think that they own the positions they own the boardroom, they own the CEO sp spots, they own the heads of universities, they own the media. They don't own anything. They happen to be the people who are in the seat today, but we all own it and have a right to it. So everything, and we have to stand up as black women, as Latinx women, as Latinx men, et cetera, to say, um, no longer guys, no longer longer, we should Thank participate. You. We should participate. I mean, by the way, I don't, this is not, as I say all the time, I'm not yeah. against white men. I just want us to be included. Can we just be included in the conversation? Right. Ursula Burns, Erica James, thank you both very much for joining me. I wish we had more time, but I'm afraid we have to, to finish now. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. And Erica, I'll come out to visit you, invite me. <laughs> it was <laughs> fascinating to hear you both. <laughs> I'll be back shortly with Warby Parker CEO, Neil Blumenthal. Hi, I'm Kelly Collis. According to a recent survey from the Washington Post Insight team and Citrix, when it comes to wellness, most will exercise, eat nutritious food, and get plenty of sleep to achieve well-being in their personal lives. But few think of the impact it will have on their work lives. Today, it may be more critical than ever for leaders to face well-being challenges head on for their employees to thrive. This afternoon, I'm pleased to be joined by Donna Kimmel, Chief People Officer at Citrix, and Dr. Amit Sood, Executive Director of the Global Center for Resiliency and Wellbeing, to talk about how we can build a healthy workforce of the future and why it is essential to think about well-being at work. Let's start off with Dr. Sood. What are the risks if companies ignore well-being or say that's something people need to manage on their own time? Can we really separate work from well-being? That's a great question, Kelly. You lose good people if you neglect well-being. See, we don't have two brains. You know, one brain I leave at home and the other brain I bring at work. Uh, so helping brain be stronger and more focused helps both your personal and professional life. Essentially, when people come to work, they are bringing their cognition and emotion. Cognition is your attention, judgment, decision-making ability, and emotion is your access to uplifting emotions, meaning passion, drive. Right? So most well-being programs train both cognition and emotion, all the good well-being programs. So when you are offering a well-being program, you're actually essentially training skills that your employees need to perform effectively. So neglecting that is, is you might lose the good people and the good people who stay with you may not engage as much with work. Now, Donna, you've been hearing the perspective from the C-suite about corporate purpose and why it's so important. But let's focus on a key component of a healthy, successful company, employee well-being. What are some of the most common employee well-being needs and how can companies address them? 
Yeah, you know, this is a really important question. I'd just love to build on what Dr. Sood had just shared. You know, I think ultimately we all know that talent and people matter in an organization. It's talent that who that truly drives the success of any business. And many leaders really now incorporate a talent first approach into their culture and values. You know, employee well-being needs really have changed uh, over the years. I think we all know that we have focused in the past very heavily on physical health. And though we still do that, offering gyms, healthy snacks, that sort of thing, we also know that there's more of a focus on um, mental well-being. Uh, and we, you know, as we've all come through the pandemic with a lot of uncertainty and volatility, uh, clearly we need to make sure that we have strategies that help our employees manage anxiety, manage feeling overwhelmed or feelings of you know, loss or loneliness. Uh, we need to continue to help build resilience and stamina. And I think some ideas of things that companies can do to help you know, provide this bridge, I think first and foremost, is really to make sure that we, that we give permission to talk about it. We need to stop the stigma around mental health or not talking about wellness by enabling those topics to truly be part of the dialogue. We also need to make sure that we're providing easy access to counseling and we want to make sure that we're offering programs, just as Dr. Sood was talking about, that promote mindfulness, such as meditation and yoga. We also can teach managers and coworkers how to have conversations about mental health so that that helps eliminate the, the, the stigma when people get comfortable with it. There are programs out there that teach it. There's one that we use called Mental Health First Aiders. Uh, it's been terrific for us um, globally. Organizations, I think, also can make sure that they help employees think about interweaving their personal and you know, professional uh, lives and needs. We're, we're in a culture now where always on. Um, boundaries really are blurred. You know, we think about we don't really have commuting, commuting downtime anymore. There's caregiving, constant caregiving that's happening if you've got you know, children or elder care. So I think you know, as companies think about additional ways that they can help their employees with this balance, it's looking at helping them block time that they need potentially during the day, um, making sure that they're taking vacations, helping to manage you know, workloads and priorities, providing technology that creates ease versus complexity in their day. I think another area is flexible hybrid work, enabling employees to choose when and how they work as long as we're able to continue to maintain you know, productivity and outcomes. And I think another area is really looking at our customizable benefits. You know, the U.S. Department of Labor came out with a statistic, a pretty alarming one, that during COVID, women have been leaving the workforce four times the rate of men. And that really causes us, I think, to step back to say there's really no such thing as one size fits all. It's really looking at the individual needs and the differing needs of our employees. So I think ultimately there are so many companies out there doing creative things that help bridge wellness into their workplace. And I think uh, ultimately it's, it's thinking about all of our health and well-being needs, physical, social, spiritual, financial, as well as emotional, as we really design whole person employee experiences. Well, I want to get back to Dr. Sood. We are kind of winding down our, our segment today, but I want to get a few more thoughts real quick. You've written, uh, when facing adversity, people can do more than cope. They can grow and they can rise. What advice would you give people that feel like they can barely hold it together? Well, I've been in the resilience space for the last 20 years, and I cry every month, if not every week. So if you have it together, you're doing great. As a response to adversity, you could either become disrupted, reintegrate, or grow. Those are the three options. We know that disruption is not a good idea. Reintegration is good, but you actually want to become stronger at your weaker parts as a, because of the adversity. So we have no choice but to grow. But at this point, I think, and, and you know that crying actually helps immunity. It helps your immune system. So if you are someone who cries to, uh, to bring that laughter in the end, I think that's healthy and there's nothing to feel bad about it. Donna, to close out our segment today, you've experienced the workforce rise together despite the continuous strain of the pandemic. What would you see um, in the future, in the coming months? What practices will you keep? Will you get rid of? Will you strive to kind of incorporate in the next year? Yep. So again, I think really quickly again to tie what to what Dr. Sood has said. One, we want to keep caring for our you know our colleagues. It is about our humanity. It is about making sure that we recognize the whole person comes to work. So first, I would definitely keep the experience um, of connectedness that has happened during the pandemic. 
I, I would ditch um, really thinking about the typical employee and coming back to understanding we need to customize, we need to understand what's important to individuals. We've had a peek into everybody's lives in their homes during the pandemic, and that has given us a sense of what people are grappling with. And I think really in terms of what we're striving for is to move a lot faster um, towards creating cultures where employees can ask for and get the help that they need to be their very best because every single employee wants to come in every day and be the best that they can be uh, in terms of helping a company be uh, successful. Thank you both for joining me. That's all the time we have today. Now I'd like to turn it back over to the Washington Post. Welcome back. If you're just joining me, I'm Francis Steed Sellers, a senior writer at The Washington Post. My next guest is Neil Blumenthal. He's the co-founder and co-CEO of Warby Parker. Welcome, Neil. Thanks for having me. Well, we're delighted to have you. So part of your founding mission has been the give a pair, sorry, buy a pair, give a pair mission. Um, how did that become part of your founding mission and how does it work in a competitive marketplace? Sure. You know, I think companies decide to do good in the world uh, because founders themselves are employees and we want to work at companies that have broad impact. So when my co-founders, Jeff, Andy, Dave and I were thinking about starting Warby Parker, right, we thought that it was an inherent good to charge $95 for prescription glasses instead of charging four or $500. Right? We were trying to solve our own problem when we would go into an optical shop, get excited about a pair of glasses, and then walk out feeling like we got ripped off. So while we knew that that was inherently good to bring down the prices of prescription glasses in the US, we still knew that there were hundreds of millions of people around the world that didn't have access to glasses and, and couldn't afford $95 glasses, for example. So we thought, how can we best serve that population? Uh, and one idea was, hey, let's commit a percent of profits or a percent of revenue. Um, we ultimately decided against that because if we weren't running the company, we thought that that those numbers could be manipulated perhaps in the future. And ultimately, what was impact? Impact was getting glasses on the faces of people who needed them. So we committed to provide a pair of glasses for every pair that we sell. So now we give ourselves, you know, uh, roughly a year from when we sell a pair of glasses to make sure that we get a pair of glasses on somebody's face who needs them. Um, and I'll tell you that it motivates me to come to work uh, every day. And it's uh, one of the main reasons why people come to work at Warby Parker. And we've now distributed uh, over 8 million pairs of glasses to people around the world and here in the US. So how unusual do you think your company is with that kind of mission? I know that the business round table in 2019 said that companies need to operate for the for the benefit of, of stakeholders from customers to shareholders and of course employees. Is it broader than Warby Parker? Yeah. yeah, you know, I think when we started the company in 2010, it was pretty rare, but I think increasingly more and more companies are realizing that their missions are to give back to the communities in which they operate. Um, and some of this, frankly, is driven and more prevalent in the tech sector. So Warby Parker lives within the tech world, within the fashion retail world, within uh, the healthcare world, within the social enterprise world. Um, but particularly uh, what we've seen in the tech sector is a pretty tight labor market, um, particularly for software engineers. Um, and when you're competing for talent, 
Um, right, you want to create the best working environment possible, and there's nothing better than having a mission that's going to improve the world. So I think we've started to see that with some tech companies, and 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 it's spread. So if you if companies needed to rationalize, which I don't think that they need to, but if they needed wanted to rationalize doing good in the world, they could do it as part of their HR strategy and how they uh, recruit and retain talent. I can't resist asking, having just spoken with Erica James from the Wharton School, and of course you're a graduate of the Wharton School, is this an ethos you, you, you found among fellow students when you were coming through the school, and do you think it's brought among business school students now? Um, absolutely, and, it, and it's certainly core to the culture uh, at the Wharton School. You know, when I think about my classmates and what they've gone on to do, in fact, many are entrepreneurs, uh, whether it's our classmate Joey who started Allbirds, uh, right, the sustainable uh, footwear brand, or um, our friend Matt Folson, who started Omaze that uses sweepstakes to raise money for causes uh, uh, around the world, um, or other businesses that provide elder care. Uh, so it's, it's core to the culture at Wharton, and we're seeing it at more and more business schools, um, which is great because. Frankly, uh, businesses uh, are having more impact on all of our lives than at any point during human history. And in, in some ways, um, businesses are starting to fill certain roles where uh, government should, but isn't. So one example is around voting, right? In the US, it is really difficult to vote and it shouldn't be, um, but because there are political incentives for one party, for example, to uh, have fewer people vote, um, and for another party to have more people vote, right, there are incentives uh, for whichever government is in power to make it more difficult to vote, and then it's incumbent on uh, businesses to make it easier. So whether that's providing paid time off um, or providing information on how to register to vote, right, uh, these are things that businesses can and should do. So let's talk a little bit about finances as well. Um, over the recent decades, wages have risen only slowly and CEO salaries have shot way, way, or compensation has shot way, way up. Should there be some sort of rebalance in that uh, dichotomy? You know, inequality is, is not good for anyone. It's not good for business. Um, it's not good for the health of society, uh, right? It leads to uh, less happiness. It leads to less innovation. Um, and we see uh, a lot of the growth in inequality start during tax changes that came into effect uh, in, in the 80s. So one of the things that we could do to help uh, reduce inequality is look at our, our tax structure. Um, and you know, I know this came up during your last uh, session, but just how we tax capital versus uh, how we tax wages, for example. Right, and then to bring us right up to date, um, how have the, the, the crisis over the pandemic and then racial injustice changed the demands of leadership? How have they altered the way you think about your relationship with your employees, your shareholders, and your customers? So I don't think it fundamentally changes how I think about all those stakeholders, but it was certainly a very trying time being a leader in, in times of a crisis. And that's where uh, leadership is either sh shown or falls by the wayside. And during a crisis, right, you need to over-communicate, uh, you need to lead uh, by example. Uh, this was another situation where um, it appeared like uh, the government, um, in particular the federal government, um, was slow to react to this pandemic. You know, uh, Warby Parker, we primarily operate um, in the U.S. We have a presence in, in Canada. Uh, our supply chain extends um, to Europe and Asia. In November, we were looking at the pandemic as a supply chain risk. Right, that we thought it might impact our frame factories in Italy, China, and, and Japan. Um, and not being uh, global health experts um, or infectious disease experts, um, we weren't thinking as much, oh, is this going to come over and, and suddenly become more of a consumer risk uh, or a risk to our employees? Sure enough, it did. And as soon as it did, um, we took fast action on Friday the 13th uh, in March. 
we made the decision to close all of our retail stores. We were one of the first national retailers to, to do that uh, because we were flying blind. Uh, we didn't have good data on uh, where the virus was, how it was being transmitted, um, but there was a risk towards employees. And as a leader, your number one priority is the health and safety of your team. Now, for most business leaders, um, right, that even though it's a number one priority, it's not something that uh, is all consuming because the risk to health and safety um, is pretty de minimis, depending on the industry that you're in. Enter a pandemic and suddenly, um, right, there's, there's massive risk and you have to figure out how to protect people. And in our case, um, it was uh, sending people home from work. Uh, we continue to you know, pay our store teams, for example, um, until the CARES Act was passed and we did analysis that showed, hey, um, we could furlough employees and they would still uh, re receive comparable wages thanks to the government support that was being offered. Um, now, we also uh, sort of guaranteed uh, our team members that if they weren't, uh, if they didn't receive comparable wages uh, based on the, the CARES Act, then we would indeed make them whole. Uh, but these are decisions that you know all executives were, were faced with. Um, and I think we can look back and see, hey, which companies performed in the interests of their stakeholders and, and which, di which didn't. So we had a Wharton professor, Adam Grant, on, on Tuesday this week, and I'd like to read to you something he said and ask if you agree and what you think it, it, it entails. He said, the COVID-19 crisis may inspire a movement towards more ethical, compassionate leadership. Employees will demand it. Do you agree with that? And what does that mean in, in terms of taking actions? I, I hope so. Um, and, you know, I, I think... Again, sometimes it's dependent on the state of, of the economy, you know, uh, and for certain skill sets, um, right, labor is mobile and it's more mobile than it's ever been in, in the history of the world. So um, it, for those individuals choosing um, where to work, right, they can prioritize those companies that are mission driven, that consider the stakeholders, whether it's customers, employees, the environment, the community uh, at, at large. And certainly this, these past 12 months, have we have a bunch of examples of uh, companies that rose to the occasions and, and those uh, that, that didn't. Um, and I think also, you know, what we saw in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder um, was also, you know, indicative of, hey, um, are companies acting in a performative way? Um, that I know that you discussed that earlier in the last session. Um, or is this a genuine desire to create change, but putting resources uh, be behind it? And what we saw, there were a lot of companies that were really fast to issue statements. Um, and then what you saw on social media, right, because now, uh, right, access to information is so widespread um, and everybody has a voice that can be quickly amplified, is that we saw employees at many of these companies that issued th these statements say, hey, um, you're saying this, but you don't live it every day. Um, and I think that was a wake up call to a lot of executives and businesses that say, hey, you gotta put your money where your mouth is. Um, and that uh, money where your mouth is is not just a, a donation, um, it's looking internally and seeing, hey, what can we do as an organization to fight systemic racism? What can we do to create um, a more inclusive and, and diverse company? So instead of asking those questions, tell me exactly what you can do to create an anti-racist environment in a company. So one of the first things that you could do is publish your diversity stats, uh, right? You sign a light on things and uh, that immediately starts to result in uh, accountability. Now, diversity is uh, almost the last step in, in the process, right? You can't create a diverse organization if you don't create an inclusive organization. So uh, there's a bunch of places to, to start there. Uh, one is on the hiring front. Uh, right? For example, we provide training um, to all of our hiring managers on inclusive interviewing techniques, right? To, and we provide training on, on unconscious bias. 
So that way uh, we can reduce unconscious bias in the hiring process. Uh, we work to create a more inclusive organization by focusing on microaggressions, living our values, um, creating ERGs and uh, ensuring that all voices uh, are heard and constantly reevaluating our processes and policies to ensure that they are indeed inclusive. And how do you make sure employees know they're being heard when they have raised issues about uh, diversity or perhaps the pandemic? So for one thing is to ensure that executives uh, meet and speak with team members irrespective of their seniority. So, you know, one of the things that my co-founder and co-CEO Dave and I did was uh, go on a listening tour and uh, meet with a, a lot of our black employees in, in particular. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, we learned was that there was more microaggressions at Warby Parker than we thought there were. Um, so as we thought about different trainings to provide, um, we doubled down on trainings around uh, microaggressions. So whether it was a black female engineer um, who in our pantry uh, was given a, a plate uh, because a white employee thought that she was part of the facilities team, um, right? And one of the things that we saw was one of our core values um, is to assume positive intent. And on the surface, this is a great core value. And, and one of the reasons why um, we created it, presumed positive intent, was that so we could have intellectually honest discussions, right? We could debate ideas, but we don't want to debate people's motivations or intent, right? Everyone's at Warby Parker to create a better world, to provide vision to, to the world. But what we found was that at times when somebody had committed a microaggression, like the example I just mentioned, they might fall behind, oh, um, well, I didn't mean to, and you know, you, one of our core values is presume positive intent. And uh, that's not the way to use that value. So that's something that Dave and I spoke very openly about to the, to the team, like that's not acceptable. When you make a mistake, Right? If you were to step on someone's foot, for example, your first reaction is, oh, I didn't mean to. No, it's, I apologize. Are you okay? Is there anything I can help you with um, before you get into intent? And it's sort of the difference between intent and, and impact. Um, and these are the conversations that companies need to be having right now. So as you have tried to build a diverse and inclusive uh, workplace, You've tried these, these, these various strategies yourself, but what has not worked? Have there been issues you've come up against where you've realized things have not worked? You know, it's, it's hard to point to a specific policy that I would say um, has not worked. You know, when I look at Warby Parker, it's not as diverse or inclusive as I want it to be. So in that case, I look at the last 10 years and say, yeah, there's definitely things that um, we could have done better. And hopefully we're on that path now. And you have changed, I think, your meeting times to accommodate working parents. Um, what can companies do to better accommodate the needs of working parents, particularly in the pandemic, when women have hit so hard and often having to manage childcare as well as their jobs? You know, flexibility is the is the name of the game for everybody, but particularly for for parents in the midst of this pandemic. Um, so uh, we're trying to create policies um, so that way uh, there is more flexibility in terms of time when somebody is is working. And the most important thing is to have voices in the room sitting around the table when you're making these decisions. So, you know, early on in Warby Parker, um, right, we started Warby Parker, um, I was, you know, roughly 30 years old. Um, I think a lot of the people around the table are in their 20s or early 30s. Um, we would have our executive team meeting at like 8.30 in the morning. It wasn't until um, uh, we had a parent on the executive team that said, hey, you know what, this is the worst possible time because this is the time that I'm dropping off, uh, you know, my daughter uh, to, to school. Um, so that was a really easy change to say, oh, well, let's just move the meeting from 8.30 to, to 9.00. Um, but you need to have diverse perspectives around the room to ensure that policies and processes that are being created and norms are indeed inclusive. And you have increased your efforts to, to increase um, employee well-being. What have you learned about what people need, apart from flexibility, which is, of course, huge, uh, going through tough times like this? 
So one big thing is uh, increased communication. So I would typically have a weekly all hands meeting. Um, and now we do it twice a week. So that way we're constantly sharing information quickly and people feel connected. Um, one of the other big things is around um, uh, mental health resources. You know, in general, I think the U.S. has underinvested um, in, in uh, mental health care and companies uh, as well. So getting supplements to health insurance plans. This is a really difficult and, and stressful time. Um, and uh, companies need to be supporting uh, our team members. I have time for just one question, and I'm going to ask an, a question that was sent in by one of our viewers. This is from Maggie Pauline in Virginia, and I read it to you. What's your advice for engaging with employees when everyone is remote? Tips for how to lead virtually. So um, it can be really challenging. The best thing to do is constantly be switching it up. And I think there's this belief that, hey, we should be on Zoom or on Skype or on Google Meet 24 seven. And that's not necessarily the answer. It is good to be able to see somebody, but frankly, it's exhausting being on eight to 10 hours of video conferences because frankly, there is actually increased cognitive load because there's a slight delay between the video and the audio that one hears. Um, and there's some research that shows, and actually uh, you mentioned Adam Grant earlier, Adam Grant shared this with me, that shows that humans can better deduce emotion um, audioly as opposed to visually. Um, so you actually might have some better conversations just over the phone than through a video conference. But one of the things that I would suggest <clears throat> is more frequent, <clears throat> more frequent, more frequent but shorter calls and meetings um, and also more skip level uh, meetings and just uh, trying to find ways and excuses to, to connect with, with one another, right? In the office, you have all these serendipitous collisions when you walk uh, to a meeting or you run to the bathroom and you need to create that in a remote setting. Well, thank you very much for joining us both by video and audio today, Neil Blumapel. Thanks for having me. We were delighted. Tomorrow at 9 a.m., my colleague Jonathan Capehart will be back to talk with reporters and columnists about the big stories of the day. So don't miss that on Washington Post Live. I'm Francis Steed Sellers. Thank you so much for joining us today.